whom I haven't met yet. My name is Greg Oldford. I'm a PhD student here at IOF. I started in September. Um, I took leave from DFO, and so I get the pleasure today of introducing our two uh, speakers from Fisheries and Oceans Canada. <clears throat> and uh, DFO is a very large organization, it's like 11,000 people. Uh, so we don't hang all the time. But I do have a little something on Neil. Uh, I'll tell you a brief story about my first experience in British Columbia. I, I came to British Columbia in 2014 to take a new job at, at DFO. And they sat me at a desk and they told me it was Neil Davis's old desk, which reminded me of the first time I came to BC to tree plant in 2002. And I met a number of very interesting characters uh, during my time near Prince George tree planting, including our foreman, who is uh, uh, also named Neil Davis. And he was a very, very hard worker. He worked literally like 140 hours a week, I think, maybe four hours sleep a night, as far as I can tell. And um, so naturally I brought it up in 2014 to my manager. And, you know, I described him as a as a you know, bearded, scruffy, dreadlocked fellow who uh, you know, kind of ripped. And she had a, had a pretty good laugh at that and said, there's absolutely no way it's the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, long story short, uh, same guy. <laughs> so as, as long as I've known Neil, he's, uh, he's been a leader. He's, been, um, he's had a reputation for... Um, being very considerate and uh, thoughtful and a uh, reputation for very hard work. And, and so he has, um, not surprisingly, uh, found himself in a position of quite a quite big responsibility at uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. He is currently the Director of Program Delivery at Regional Headquarters in Vancouver. He oversees the management of non-salmon fisheries, marine mammals, and marine species at risk on Canada's Pacific coast. He currently serves as a Canadian commissioner to the International Pacific Halibut Commission. He joined Fisheries and Oceans Canada in 2009 as a senior program manager for integrated oceans management in the Pacific region before becoming the ground fish regional manager in 2012. This role entailed responsibility for the management of halibut, multi-species bottom trawl, hake, sablefish, rockfish, link cod, and dogfish fisheries, and consultation with the diversity of indigenous, commercial, recreational, and non-governmental parties. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resource Conservation and a Master's of Science degree in Fisheries Management from UBC. He used to attend fish 500 seminars when he was a student and is worried about all the clever questions you might ask after the presentation. Uh, next day we have Dr. Robin Forrest, who many of you may know from her time here uh, as a PhD student at UBC. She uh, is a research scientist and section head, um, but she began as a research scientist at the Pacific Biological Station since in 2009. And she is currently the section head of the Quantitative Methods section. It's the, in the Stock Assessment and Research Division. She supervises 18 staff members and manages several research projects. She has a Bachelor of Science from the University of Sydney, a PhD from the UBC Fisheries Center in 2008, working with Dr. Tony Pitcher and co-advised by uh, Carl Walters and um, Steve Mar Martel. Her PhD included comparison of the performance of ecosystem and Atlantis ecosystem models, and she developed a novel research method for estimating reference points for data-limited shark species. Following her PhD, she worked as a postdoctoral fellow at UBC uh, with Murdoch McAllister, and her selected research includes management strategy evaluation for fisheries, implementation of ecosystem-based fisheries management, productivity and management of data-limited species, and fleet responses to fishery management systems. So I'm going to jump right into it because we have a fair number of slides and um, we want to leave a bit of time for questions at the end. Um, the, uh, the last time I was here I think was as a, as a grad student, which I left in about 2008. 
So it's kind of neat to be back. Uh, the reason we're here is we really kind of wanted to reach out and um, talk a little bit with the research institutions that are turning out students um, and hosting researchers that do work very closely related to a lot of the stuff that we work on as well. So we thought we'd talk a little bit about what do we do and what does it look like these days? Um, how does our mandate, um, how has it evolved? What are some of the challenges we're facing? Um, we're going to use a case study to kind of explore some of this um, and then talk a little bit about how science and management work together. But why are we really here? Well, to kind of share more about who we are, invite some opportunities for collaboration, and a bit of shape for smart, educated job seekers. So who we are, Program Delivery, which is the group that I oversee, has a bunch of different areas, fisheries focused, and then others that are not fisheries focused, um, marine mammals, uh, marine species at risk, and then a, a more of a kind of policy implementation group as well. So pretty diverse, we get involved in lots of different things. In general, um, some of these are kind of truisms that I'm sure you don't uh, need to be reminded of in too much detail, but there is a fair amount that's changing around us. Um, public expectations, uh, the legal landscape is constantly changing, and government priorities have changed uh, quite significantly between, say, the last government and the current government. Additionally, our natural environment is changing. We're learning more about it, which illuminates new issues. Um, there are certainly some very clear examples of competition or at least consideration that needs to be given to how we manage for multiple uses of the marine environment. And all that in the context of making decisions around fisheries means there's more we need to consider. So here's just sort of a sample of things that have uh, been introduced over the last 15 years or so. I'm not going to go through all of them. But what I do want to convey is that Overall, we're moving from what we might kind of generally think of as like a more traditional version or um, um, concept of fisheries management to something that's become quite a bit broader where, um, you know, we are being asked to think more carefully and in a more structured way about the implications of fisheries for ecosystems. Um, we're much more... Um, involved with things like the um, development and implementation of marine protected areas. Uh, our current government has made um, a number of very strong commitments to things like reconciliation with indigenous people. And there are currently a number of changes proposed to the Fisheries Act that are making their way through parliamentary and Senate review processes that are going to also introduce new requirements, stock rebuilding requirements. Um, a requirement to take into consideration Aboriginal traditional knowledge in a much more formal way than we have to date. So those are just sort of some various examples. The last one that's also worth noting is right at the bottom. Sport decisions also have a very immediate and um, sometimes significant uh, effect on how we are uh, required to do our business. And so that's... Um, that can be relevant in a number of ways. The one I've highlighted here is just with respect to the nature of Aboriginal fishing rights. So what does it all mean for a week of work? Um, I thought it might be kind of interesting just to kind of show you that like this list could literally be a fisheries managers um, or anyone in my group. This is what their week could entail. Uh, you could be reviewing a stock assessment from our science branch, someone like Robin or someone in her group. Um, you could be swearing an affidavit relating to a court case um, given litigation that's been brought against the department by some external group. Reviewing a recovery strategy for a species at risk, participating in an internal working group on spill response planning, chairing public meetings, um, meeting with advisory bodies to the department, advising Canadian commissioners on international treaty fishery issues, writing speaking points for the minister. Um, you know, it's it's definitely a place where if you enjoy being in the center of the action and being involved with a number of different things has a lot to offer you. Um, certainly need to be in some respects a jack of many trades um, rather than sort of a, a specialist or someone that um, likes to go away and think on their own for a long time. 
uh, somebody's going to likely interrupt you or ask you to join a meeting. So um, that's kind of the background that we wanted to start with to give you a bit of context for how we see our um, work evolving. And what we'd like to do now is talk a little bit about um, a particular example of how fisheries management changed. And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll walk through that a little bit, but then come back to this idea of, okay, so this is some work we did 12 years ago. What's changed since then and how many of these kind of newer requirements or obligations did this very, at the time, cutting ed edge and innovative work actually address? And which ones uh, do we still need to do work on? Uh, and then we're going to sort of invite Robin up, or I'm going to invite Robin up to speak about how science fits into that and how it supports the decision making uh, that, uh, that we do and where some of the gaps and, and the, the areas of focus are. The case study I'm going to talk about is groundfish fisheries in integration. So this is a, a group of seven fairly distinct fisheries. They employ a range of gear types. They're distributed coastwide. They fish year round. There's about 300 unique vessels that participate in these fisheries. They land a whole bunch and they make a whole bunch of money. Groundfish includes a very, uh, in the way that it's defined for our context, includes a very broad range of species. It's almost everything that lives on the bottom of the sea and, and swims. Um, so that can be flatfishes, roundfishes, rockfishes, sharks, skates, etc. So you see um, sort of how diverse it can be. So here's a, a quick snapshot of what the landings look like. Interesting to note here um, for this and the next slide, a hake, halibut, and sablefish. So just three examples of some of the species that are caught. Hake is a very large volume fishery. By comparison, sablefish and halibut are low volume. But when you go to the value, things change a lot. Halibut is very high value, so is sablefish. Hake much less so. so the fisheries are very distinct. Some are all about volume to make their money, and others are really about, um, about the value per pound. So before we introduced groundfish integration, these fisheries were managed in a whole bunch of different ways. Some of them were managed with individual transferable quotas. Others were managed with a combination of a whole bunch of what now look fairly arcane um, as, as sort of management controls compared to the way they're managed now. Um, but the, one of the key columns is the last one. At sea monitoring was a real issue. So <clears throat> the reason that is, is that um, key uh, species that are caught in most of those fisheries include rockfish. Rockfish don't do well when caught and brought to the surface and released. They mostly die um, due to barrel trauma. And we had science advice that suggested their stocks were in pretty serious decline. So why from that um, that was indicating that there's a lot of rockfish being caught, we really couldn't gauge how much. And due to the incentives that were created around reporting, uh, fishers reporting their catch, we had no real confidence that the information fishers might record uh, was an accurate reflection of how much was being caught. So you know, ultimately, it didn't make these individual fishermen uh, accountable for their catch of rockfish, which was often a bycatch to what they were aiming for, whether that's halibut or sablefish or lingcod or something else. And we didn't have any way to make them fish responsibly for it. This was everyone's problem. So on the, on the left, you have all the species that um, could be caught, and on the right are the fisheries. Everybody's catching each other's fish. So you might be a halibut fisher with a halibut license, but the truth is, you're out there fishing for halibut, and you're catching rockfish, lingcod, etc. So in 2003, we said we got to change. Um, we set out some kind of principles that would need to be met if we were to adjust the management system for all of these fisheries. We said all ground fish catch must be accounted for, and we're going to manage those um, species on a stock-specific basis. You know, we're going to make fishermen individually accountable for their catch and introduce some new monitoring standards so that we essentially have more confidence in the catch uh, information. So as a result, I realize these were all bulleted out like that. Um, 
After about three years of negotiations and consultations between the department and industry, uh, we ended up with a system where all of those seven fisheries essentially moved to um, individual transferable quota management. We created permissions to allow for the retention of all species. So previously, if you were a halibut fisher, you would have been limited in what you could retain if you caught rockfish. So you would have been forced by our regulations to discard it. Then you wouldn't necessarily have recorded it accurately in your logbook. Those fish would have died. We never would have known how many. And the result is Margo. Not good information about how much is being caught compared to what we think is sustainable. So <clears throat> um, we started allowing for all those species to be retained, reduce the wastage, allow for trading of those quotas between fisheries. So you never know how much you're going to catch over the course of a year. Allow fishers to trade that back and forth to cover what they catch as the fishing season progresses. And we introduced, perhaps most importantly from a, ma a management perspective, 100% at sea monitoring for all of the fisheries. So for most of the fleets, that means electronic monitoring. And here are the components of it. It essentially consists of cameras, GPS sensors that tell us where you are, cameras, video, what you're catching as it comes over the side of your boat. There are a variety of sensors that detect when you start and end fishing so we know when to turn on the cameras, what it looks like. Um, a couple mounted on the arm over the side of the boat. A winch sensor in the yellow circle on the bottom right there that detects when the hydraulic drum to pull the net over the side uh, kicks in or the line on the gear you're fishing with. So the results of integration are perhaps a bit of a mixed bag, uh, but lots of good things from the perspective of conservation and sustainability. So it gave incentives for fishers to fish selectively, to minimize their wastage, to reduce the impact on the ecosystem, and they were kind of obligated um, now by virtue of being monitored all the time at sea and when they land their fish dockside to collect very accurate information about what they're catching. Every single fish that comes over the side of the boat. Um, from a fisher's perspective, it also did some good things in terms of providing stability within the commercial fleet. So it got us out of the race for fish, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with as a sort of concept in fisheries. And it provided more certainty that allowed uh, these, these fishers and their businesses to kind of plan ahead a little more. From a data outcomes perspective, which Robin will talk about a little more, um, it also resulted in some really great, very um, finely resolved data about the fishery, um, which can be used for any number of uh, different purposes to inform management decisions and conduct all kinds of interesting research. So I'm going to leave Robin to talk about that more. Other implications. Um, you can spread your fishing out over the course of the year. You can start landing fish when it makes the most economic sense to do so. Um, it created this opportunity to transfer quota between fishers, which has some positive implications, but also can create some challenging implications from the perspective of armchair fishers, those who just lease their quota but don't fish. Um, it can lead to the concentration of quota, especially when combined with the costs associated with introducing these monitoring requirements. So some difficult trade-offs there, uh, which you know could be the whole subject of another presentation or thesis, et cetera. Um, it also really put a focus on um, stock assessment. So now you've got quota and TACs for all of these species. There's a real interest in making sure we've got some sense of how much should we be fishing. Combine that with the market-based programs around certification um, that fishers are now chasing, um, and, and the incentive to actually have stock assessment information has, has really been increased. So going back to that list of drivers I had at the beginning, putting them briefly on the left, in summary, this work on integration really helped us with certain kind of obligations or responsibilities that we might associate with more traditional fisheries management. So helps us with species at risk because we can exert greater management control over managing any species at risk. Doesn't necessarily help with the science around um, the resources needed to assess all those species. It can certainly help in us taking a, a more precautionary approach, again, because it provides us greater control. It has reduced benthic impacts because it's resulted in a smaller fishing footprint, which Robin will touch on. 
hasn't really done anything with respect to forage species, wasn't really intended to address that, but certainly has um, resulted in what a lot of people call the gold standard with respect to monitoring and catch reporting. So we now know everything that comes over the side of the boat, and we weigh everything by species when it's landed, and it's all independently verified, which um, is very useful in terms of ensuring sustainability. Similarly, with respect to bycatch, it's really um, changed what bycatch means. So uh, you know, that's a bit of a slippery term, but if you can now retain what you catch, even if it wasn't necessarily your primary species, it's no longer really bycatch. Um, that's not always the case, and we're, you're welcome to ask questions about that later, but it's done a lot to reduce a bycatch and the wastage associated with it. It's done very little with respect to things like climate change or um, aiming at helping us meet our marine conservation targets to implement MPAs in 10% of the, our oceans by 2020. With respect to things like reconciliation with indigenous people, on the one hand, it's created a lot of value and stability in these fisheries, which means that our initiatives to provide First Nations with greater access means there's greater value in the access we're providing. But it's also much more expensive to try and acquire that access, which makes it more difficult to provide as much of it. There's also a lot of questions about how well the management of these fisheries align with the way that some First Nations may want to be fishing, i.e., uh, that it could look quite different than the way we manage current commercial fisheries, and that creates a, a different and separate set of questions. Certainly, as I said, a whole other discussion we could have about sort of the social and economic implications of these management changes, and um, I would say that there are very diverse perspectives uh, around that. And then there's a bunch of things that I think are also interesting to talk about with respect to how much is it done around um, enabling or supporting ecosystem-based fisheries management? And really, we're still driven by single species management and seeing the limitations of that. So now I'm going to turn it over to Robin, and she's going to talk about, from a science perspective, what are we doing to try and address some of these challenges and give you some, some examples of work underway um, that's really aimed at um, trying to fill some of the gaps in that last slide and identifying where there's still work to be done. Thanks very much for that great overview, Neil. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about how science is supporting some of these diverse needs. I'd say since I've been at DFO since I started in 2009, I've spent a lot of time on the phone with Neil, in meetings with Neil. We work very closely together on a number of different issues. So I'll go back to... Uh, when this government, uh, the current government, was first elected, um, the Prime Minister made his mandate letters to his ministers public for the first time. So we got to read what the, what the Prime Minister gave to his ministers uh, as their mandates. And uh, in the letter to the Minister of Fisheries, uh, evidence-based decision-making was a very high priority in that letter, uh, using, and you know, this is just a quote from one bullet point, use scientific evidence and the precautionary approach to take into account climate change, making decisions affecting fish stocks and ecosystem management. And these same principles are enshrined in the new Fisheries Act, which is coming out, uh, take into account climate considerations, et cetera. So we are actually mandated as we go forward into addressing some of these very complicated issues, which I'm sure a lot of you are well aware. Uh, it's very um, complex. So I'll just start with um, Canada's precautionary approach. This is also going to be enshrined in the new Fisheries Act in law. Uh, some of you will be familiar with a graph like this. This is a harvest control rule. It's characterized by three zones. Uh, you have your stock status or biomass on the x-axis, your removal rate on the y-axis. You have a critical zone when the stock is below its limit reference point, a cautious zone, and a healthy zone when it's above its upper stock reference. Or, uh, man we're mandated to apply a rebuilding plan when a stock is in the critical zone. So while somewhat problematic, uh, which I, for reasons I won't go into, this figure does lay out a fairly straightforward interpretation of the precautionary approach for single species advice. We don't yet have a consensus on how to develop harvest strategies that meet broader requirements, such as accounting for ecosystem considerations, climate change, reconciliation, which uh, Neil was speaking about before. 
There are two national working groups, which I'll touch on briefly at the end, on ecosystem considerations and climate change. Uh, management strategy evaluation can help. Uh, some of you might have seen my section's talk in April about different management strategy evaluation initiatives that we have in, uh, in our group. But so far, it's really been on a case-by-case -case approach uh, as needed for various stocks and very specific questions, such as stocks where we know natural mortality has been rising, and so we try to account for that in the, uh, in the uh, harvest strategy. We, we haven't really had uh, an overarching approach. So what I could do is, um, is just give you an example of how the process by which science supports fisheries management, I think it would be fairly dry for me to talk you through all the all the ins and outs of the process that by which Neil asks us for advice, goes through our CSAS process, et cetera. But instead, I'll try to give you some more colorful case studies and just a little snapshot of some of the work we have going on. Hopefully, it will uh, make you think about some of the work you're doing and possibly inspire you to think about working with us. So internally, we have uh, two uh, DFO funding sources for research on ecosystem and climate considerations and advice. One is the Strategic Program for Ecosystem-Based Research and Advice, SPERA. The other, Aquatic Climate Change Adaptation Services Program, or ACASP. And we have to write proposals, just like you do. And uh, the proposals must be demonstrated to meet a policy need. If we just say we want to explore something, it will be rejected out of hand. We have to have a collaborator in resource management. It's usually Neil. He's got his name on an awful lot of proposals. Uh, and preferably include broad collaboration both inside and outside DFO. So we do have collaborations with people here. Uh, typically, proposals will include funds for a postdoctoral fellow or a term biologist, sometimes a student. Um, some proposals mainly include funds for external contractors, and we do it that way. Again, a lot of those are with people here or uh, at Simon Fraser University. So I'm, I'm going to give you uh, four case studies of some different projects that um, I'm either directly involved with or peripher peripherally involved with uh, that, um, that are funded by these two programs. They're just a small sample. There's many, many of these projects going on. I picked these ones because, first of all, I know about them, and secondly, because these ones are mainly focused on ground fish, and they have members on them who are in the Stock Assessment and Research Division, uh, which is my division, and so they're directly related to uh, giving advice to resource managers. So the first one... Um, I'm going to talk about this one in a little bit more detail. The other three I'll just briefly touch on. Um, this one speaks directly to what Neil just talked about, which is groundfish integration. And we're really digging into all of that spatial logbook data, which is extensive, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of records, um, to look at how this fleet has spatially responded to this integration and 100% monitoring program. And our key questions with this is whether integration has been successful in achieving some conservation outcomes and reducing uh, bycatch of rockfish species in particular, and also what mechanisms has the fleet used to avoid uh, unwanted species, and this is a very complex multi-species fishery. And in an ecosystem context, how's fishery selectivity changed? And when we talk about ecosystem-based fisheries management, we talk a lot about trophic interactions. I think that's what most people think about. But we don't talk a lot about technological interactions, which is to do with selectivity. When you're fishing in a multi-species fishery, how do you catch what you want and avoid what you don't want? And another overarching question is, have there been spatial outcomes as a result of this program, in, and especially, have we, are we creating a refugia for rockfish species? So different locations have different species compositions. That should be obvious. Species live in different habitats, and of course, fishers know this in fine detail. They know exactly where to fish to catch what they want. Uh, they just need the right incentives to do it. Um, in some places, it's easier than others. So these little uh, pie charts on this map here, uh, different fishing locations where a fishing, we call it a fishing ground or a fishing opportunity. We used a method based on uh, Trevor Branch's work, uh, which, used, which clusters toes or, or long line sets that are close together into, uh, into little fishing grounds which are specific to an individual skipper. 
And in this one, the green on the pie chart represents uh, halibut, the proportion of halibut in that particular fishing ground over a number of years. The yellow, if you can see it, represents yellow eye rockfish. And then there's some gray in there as well, which represents other species. So you can see that over uh, on the mainland side there, uh, the water is actually shallower there. And we're, there's a lot more yellow eye rockfish habitat on that side, or habitat that's shared by halibut and yellow eye. Whereas on the left there, off of the south coast of Haida Gwaii, uh, there's more clean halibut fishing grounds. This is, a, this is a map of uh, all, fishing location, all fishing sets in the halibut longline fishery in 2006, just before integration started, and 2016. Uh, this map doesn't really show you how much the footprint of this fishery has decreased. Uh, because this map is compliant with the uh, Privacy Act, we're not allowed to show you any, any place that's fished that has less than three vessels fishing in it. So if you could see the raw data, you would see on the left in 2006 a lot more fishing happening in the middle of uh, Hecate Strait uh, and a lot more fishing down the, uh, down the coast of the mainland there. And on the right-hand side, 2016, the map pretty much looks like it looks now. So there's been a large decrease in the footprint of this fishery. And I want to talk about some work that, very briefly, that my master's student, Tiari Boys, did uh, late last year for her master's. Uh, Tiari is actually the daughter of one of the halibut fishermen. This is a very interesting project for her. Yellow eye rockfish has had a large reduction in its quota since 2015 due to a stock assessment that said that the stock was either in or close to the critical zone. So we know that halibut and yellow eye occur in the same habitat, so what effect has this had on the spatial distribution of the fishery? So halibut and yellow eye uh, share similar habitats, but it's a different pattern in the spring and the summer. So on the, uh, the top graph there, the majority of encounters um, that the halibut fishery has with halibut are in fairly deep water. Um, those two yellow bars uh, represent the depth range of yellow eye rockfish. So if you can see the little yellow uh, bars there, that's where the overlap of yellow eye and halibut is. On the right, halibut, their life history, they come up onto the shelf to feed. They start to share fishing grounds with halibut. So uh, the majority of halibut counters encounters in the summer are on exactly the same grounds as the yellow eye. So Tiari uh, did a fairly complex set of analyses and one of her findings was that in the summer, the fleet has very slightly shifted into deeper waters. We are really excited to see the, this, what the box looks like for 2018, because uh, we're going to have another year of data and another year of reduction of yellow eye quota, and we really want to see if that trend is continuing. So we know that the fleet's fishing in deeper water in the summer, and we hear we've, uh, she interviewed uh, several fishermen, and they told her that they are doing that to avoid yellow eye rockfish. And then in this plot, uh, this, is, this box plot actually um, belies a very complex set of analyses, but basically she, uh, across the fleet, she took um, all of the fishing grounds for everyone that was fishing in the halibut fishery, and she tracked whether since uh, before and after the reduction in yellow eye quota, whether uh, fishers had abandoned any of those grounds that they fished on, whether they had decreased their effort on any grounds, or whether they had increased their effort on those grounds. And she showed that in areas where they have an increased effort, they are catching less yellow eye rockfish. So that does seem to support the idea that they are increasing fishing effort in areas where they can avoid yellow eye. We're still investigating the mechanisms for the observed spatial and temporal shifts in fishing behavior in this fishery, because it's a very complex fishery. And skippers have evolved really different uh, strategies to avoid, to, uh, to be able to maximize their portfolios in this new environment where they can't discard. Uh, they have to uh, be accountable for everything they catch. So it, it's actually turned out that yellow eye quota now is really not worth much in terms of the value of yellow eye rockfish, but it's worth a lot in terms of it, as being a gateway to be able to fish for halibut. So uh, there's a lot of very strategic moving around of yellow eye quota to enable this halibut fishery to continue. So as the, hal as the yellow eye quota continues to drop, we're expecting to see much stronger patterns as that sort of that gateway into the halibut fishery starts to get squeezed. 
Uh, we've seen some changes in spatial behaviour, and they do appear to be due to avoidance of rock fishes. Can't be the whole story. Some people are shifting to fishing in summer because it's an ITQ fishery and they can fish when they want, and fishing is just much easier and nicer in the summer. But the implications for management are the question of have we created refugia by implementing the right incentives to avoid low quota species in this very complex fishery? And there's a lot more to come on this, and I will uh, hopefully be back with my postdoc, Catherine, to tell you more about this project once we have some more results. So quickly on to the second case study. This one is a much more uh, traditional, as you would think about, it, ecosystem project. This is uh, led by Chai Hong Fu, uh, at, who I work with, um, and we have a postdoc, Chuan Bo Go. Um, he's developing an Osmos model of the uh, west coast of Vancouver Island and the rest of the BC coast. Uh, he's interested in the impact of ecosystem considerations and climate change on uh, fishery reference points, uh, among other things, and the implications on this for fishing strategies and recovery. So these little graphs on the, on the side there are some preliminary, extremely preliminary um, yield curves showing uh, FMSY and the dotted lines under three different uh, oceanic productivity scenarios. So this one's trying to speak to the precautionary approach in an ecosystem sense, stock rebuilding requirements, and um, climate change in science advice, which is on the list that Neil showed you. Uh, we have another similar project. This one set out on west coast of Vancouver Island. Very similar underlying questions, um, but using a statistical approach rather than a modeling approach. This is a geostatistical approach. This is led by Jennifer Bolt and Jim Thorson at the University uh, at um, NOAA, and uh, with a postdoc, Martin Gofroyd. Uh, using uh, spatiotemporal models to account for spatial autocorrelation in fish biomass, biotic and abiotic ocean systems. So very similar questions, but instead this is looking at the covariation of species and environmental conditions, uh, with the key questions of what is the covariation of pelagic, semi, uh, pelagic and benthic fish species? Can positive and negative covariation account for potential competitive and predation interactions? And are these informative about causes of natural mortality and trophic dynamics? And what are the potential climate and ecosystem impacts on recovery of depleted prey populations? And as a stock assessment modeler, my ears prick up when I hear someone talking about natural mortality and trying to capture how natural mortality might change because that's something I can use uh, in single species advice. Similar questions, very different approach. And then another one uh, by Sean Anderson, uh, we've hired the postdoc for this one, uh, characterizing range shifts in British Columbia groundfish species in response to climate velocities. Uh, similar, very focused on groundfish, less focused on species interactions. Uh, Sean is, has developed Bayesian uh, spatiotemporal models to characterize changes in the distribution of BC groundfish species and how these relationships are changing. And Sean's main question here is, have there been latitudinal shifts, depth shifts, and or changes to range size for BC groundfish species through time? And because we have very detailed spatial survey data and, and, and very, very detailed commercial fishery data, which can, to some extent, possibly be informative about this, we can look at these questions in quite a bit of detail. Um, and the main... I think outcome for this in terms of helping resource managers is we can ask the question of which groundfish species are most sensitive to climate change and should be prioritized in terms of management. We have a couple of projects in collaboration here with UBC. Uh, one is led by William Chung with uh, stu your student colleague uh, Virginie uh, studying trophic application under climate change through end-to-end -end modeling. So again, this is another type of ecosystem model. And then a, a project that I'm directly involved with, with uh, Tom Carruthers, uh, Quang and Adrian, uh, DLM2 Phase 2, Developing Management Strategy Evaluation Packages for Advancing Science and Management of Data Limited and At-Risk Canadian Fish Stocks. And this one's really important for us because this will allow us to get to some of the uh, precautionary approach and sustainable fisheries framework needs that we have and which are going to be enshrined in the Fisheries Act for species for which we don't have a lot of data. Uh, a number of working groups have been set up nationally to uh, try to uh, come up with some more overarching um, solutions to incorporating ecosystem approaches and environmental variation and climate change into advice. Uh, 
we have uh, one of them is quite new, one of them has uh, progressed quite a bit. Uh, a lot of DFO people are involved with Pisces, uh, which is the Pacific version of ICES, and DFO staff are involved with a lot of working groups there. And then I just wanted to add, this one is new, um, ASPIRE, it's a science-led initiative, um, a science plan for indigenous reconciliation and engagement, where science is trying to get out front of how we can better engage First Nations in our delivery of science advice. So the gaps that we see in all this work, are we, we have yet to have a definitive approach for incorporating climate change and ecosystem considerations into science advice. Uh, we still are uh, unsure as to how to incorporate indigenous knowledge into science advice. Uh, many, there's a lot of uh, individual projects going on, but we are mandated to do this. We want to do this. We, uh, we need some guidance and help on how to do that. Uh, more effective and targeted collaboration, both internally with among our different divisions and also with our external partners, including you guys. And ecosystem-based management and multi-species management in general. And I think that's where a lot of expertise of you guys comes in. And the skills and experiences we're looking for, we're looking for quantitative scientists, with the, ref, the emphasis being on quantitative because that's how we really are able to deliver risk-based advice uh, to help bridge some of these gaps we've been discussing, um, ecosystem-based management level thinking, and uh, resource managers. Uh, Neil wrote this part. Uh, he's a renaissance man. Um, we need communicators, collaborators, negotiators, science literacy, uh, people that can synthesize multiple sources of information and diverse perspectives and manage many competing priorities. And we made it. <laughs> so you, if you uh, come and work for us, you can have a lot of fun in the field <laughs> and at work, at your, at your desk. Thank you.